Hello everyone. Welcome to Video Cats with Vijay. This is episode seven. My guest today is George Coldraiser, a hostage negotiator, an organizational and clinical psychologist, a distinguished professor of leadership and organizational behavior at IMD in Switzerland, and a high performance coach. George is also the author of two books, Hostage at the Table and Care to Death. George, welcome to the show. Good morning, Vijay. Glad to be here. Thank you, George. You, you have been held hostage four times. Can you please share an example of when you were held as a hostage and how you came around? Well, the most interesting one is probably the first time when I was just getting started doing domestic violence, going into homes with the police uh, to reduce the potential of homicides. And I was asked by a lieutenant at a hospital to go in and talk to a very psychotic man who was holding a nurse hostage. And he had a scissors to her throat. After I entered the room in a very short time, like two minutes, he cut her throat on the side, not the juggler. And she fell to the ground. He approached me. And in a nanosecond, I had to decide, do I throw my body at his feet? Do I uh, call the police in or do I keep talking? And the only solution really was to bond and keep talking. But then he put the scissors to my throat really pushing, never breaking the skin, screaming and shouting, I'm gonna kill everybody I can, I have nothing to live for, et cetera, et cetera. And nothing was working in the first transactions. And then I asked the question, Sam, how do you want your children to remember you? And he screamed, don't talk about my kids, bring them here, I'll kill them too, I don't love them anymore, et cetera, et cetera, but don't talk about my kids. Now, for your listeners, let me ask a question. Was that a good answer? Yes, it was. It was not what I expected. We're now, at least he responded out of that psychotic state. And his mindset was, I do not want to live. I dared myself, came back again and said, we have to talk about your kids. You want them to remember you as a murderer? I'm just going to kill myself and then I don't even have to think about it. You see, now we were in a dialogue. And he, and then I said, do you want them to remember you as somebody who commits suicide as well as murder? Is that what you want them to remember? That was the key point for him to change his mindset and start the negotiation process. And very shortly after about 10 minutes, he made a big concession when I negotiated to get Sheila out of that room. because She was bleeding pretty seriously. And then we reached a solution within another 20 minutes, and he voluntarily walked out, surrendering the scissors to me with three questions. Do, Sam, uh, do you want to give me the scissors, or do you want to put it on the floor? He said, I'll give it to you. Do you want me to uh, handcuff you? You had to be handcuffed. Or do you want the police to come in? I want you, George. And uh, then the third question is, do you want to be handcuffed in the front or the back? You see, questions are the way hostage negotiations are solved. And that situation taught me a lot about what it means to really bond and connect with somebody you don't naturally like, who's really an enemy, who's really a threat, and getting them to change the way they are thinking from um, a, a, a destructive goal to being able to cooperate and collaborate. And he walked out knowing full well he was probably going to go to prison. Does that make sense? No, absolutely. That's pretty uh, impressive. And I'm pretty curious to understand what was that that you saw? When he, he was kind of shouting and screaming and he's in a state of rage. How did he, 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 was, he was psychotic. He was psychotic, BJ. So I, I think that's a very good question because often I'm asked, when, what didn't, didn't I feel fear? Of course I felt fear. But I switched my focus from him to Sheila at first. And I wanted to get Sheila out of that room because she was screaming, my kids, my kids, my kids. And then I focused on him, not the scissors. You see, this is a very delicate moment. He, when he came to me, he could have killed me, but he didn't want to do that. He wanted something. And so realizing I had to bond with Sam and not let my mind's eye my mindset focused on that scissors was a key moment. And the, the same way is now with, with this pandemic, because remember, you can be a hostage 
not just to a person, to a situation, and many, many people are hostage to this coronavirus. You don't have to be a hostage. You don't have to feel powerless. And that's the essential function of being a hostage, whether it's to someone else or even to yourself, or as you're so interested in, to your mindset. And many people are hostage to the way they think, the way they feel, their emotions. Now, in, in these kind of situations, when there is a, such a rage, and this mind has been conditioned and set for quite a period of time, and you have a very limited time to alter that mindset, right? So it's a set mind in many ways. And what are some of the techniques that you use to establish that connection and then alter that? First of all, bonding, connecting. You see, I'm, I'm often asked, what was the key factor? Well, when he put the scissors to my throat, I immediately put my hands up on his arm. I didn't push him away, certainly didn't pull him towards me, but you see there was a bonding that happened. And the person effect, everything from my voice to my facial expressions had some impact on him. And that's the first thing, how to connect with an enemy, how to connect with someone and turn an enemy into an ally. And then secondly, understand the pain. The, the biggest mistake in driving change, VJ, is people don't hear the pain people are going to have in that change process. I've never seen a hostage situation where there wasn't loss behind it. And so we have to be able to hear that loss, empathize with it, show compassion, and then start the concession-making process. And you know how often it works? About 95% of time. That's what the research shows from the hostage negotiators in uh, Interpol and from the FBI. 95% is a pretty powerful form of leadership to change the mindset. And it's those three basic steps. It's the same situation for leaders in, uh, in the current context, because there's a lot of uh, fear, there's a lot of uncertainty. And uh, to alter that mindset from one of fear to one of hope, how do leaders approach a situation like this? Well, first of all, understand themselves. Leading self is the key. When I'm there with Sam and, and I'm facing that situation, I have to manage my own emotions, my own mindset, not focus on the scissors, focus on him. What's the goal? The goal is essential. And knowing what you want to accomplish, the outcome. And then you move in that direction by being able to take little steps and not be a hostage to whatever is happening. In this situation, we don't know what's going to happen clearly. It's a time of threat, uncertainty. And as I point out in the books, and I know you understand, the brain is fundamentally negative. The mindset is easily drifting to the negative if you don't use the executive, the frontal lobes, to manage the mindset and overcome the survival mechanism or the deep emotional mechanism in, in the brain to focus that mindset on the positive. Playing to win is very different than being driven but to be defensive. So the great leaders are those who are able to be agile, flexible. We can't predict, but whatever comes, you know you can respond. You see, the key is to not be powerless. That's the essence of a hostage. When I'm with Sam, I have to not feel powerless. I have my own power to talk, to interact, to influence. And there are so many people who are hostages to the mask, to the social distancing. And we live in a changing world. Switch from the negative to the positive. And usually that's based on curiosity and something you want to learn. Beautiful. But it's easy to do with one person, but if you are if you are a leader of an organization that has like hundred thousand people, uh, what are some tips that you would give to quickly alter the collective mindset? Yeah, well, I think one of the things is get to your top leaders who re who know what your vision is, so that you can be aligned and you can be together, and then you have to. And this is what leaders have to do: the top leaders, vision, vision, vision and see beyond what the eyes can see. See beyond what the eyes can see. I, I often tell a little story of a, a, a true story of a little girl who was fishing with her father. And suddenly as they were fishing, she looked at the sky and she said, Daddy, I can see beyond what my eyes see. That's amazing. 
And that's what leaders have to do, be able to have a vision and then be able to communicate what that vision is and then lead to, uh, to execution and get feedback about what how it's doing. So with the opportunity for uh, CEOs or top leaders to meet in collective communications, whether it's over Zoom or videos, be able to make that personal contact. And even if it's virtual, people seeing you or hearing you will influence how they take what you say. You have to be a secure base. And as the book Cara Dadair points out, um, you have to be able to show caring, which isn't necessarily meaning that you're rescuing. Sometimes it's making tough decisions, firing somebody. You can do it from a caring state, giving tough feedback, but it's also daring. And what we see leaders either not able to care, not enough empathy, compassion, or we see leaders who are afraid to take risks. And when you're doing a hostage negotiation, you're taking a risk. Uh, normally, you're not in the presence of the hostage taker. You're doing it over a phone or a bullhorn, but you still are taking a risk in how you handle that and what the result might be. It could create an explosive reaction. So you never know, but you have to be able to respond. Caring and daring is a very powerful mindset of what leaders have to do in organizations. Show empathy and compassion and be uh, taking enough risks. And we have too many leaders who are too nice. I, I like kindness. I like to, I prefer the word kindness, be kind, but you don't have to be nice. Don't sugarcoat things, say it directly. And we're seeing the examples now of people who are political leaders who don't say the truth. They don't say it in a straight way. And so people can't feel safe. And the brain needs safety. That's fundamental. So when I'm there with Sam, what did I do? I had the person effect of giving him psychological safety. He started to trust me. The fact that he gives me the scissors, the very weapon he's using to defend himself, says he is psychologically now finding me a secure base, and he's finding psychological safety in our relationship. Many leaders are not able to give that psychological safety. And if you are the head of an organization, whether it's 10 employees or 100,000 employees, you have to create that psychological safety. And this is what Google found as the essence of a high-performing team psychological safety. When that happens, the brain turns off its defensiveness and its negativity and starts focusing on the positive. Caring is causes a lot of attachment. Like you are, in a way, you are kind, you are empathetic, and you start to understand the other uh, person. And daring yeah. requires a sense of detachment. And so in a sense, you are very committed and you also need to be detached. That seems to be a pretty conflicting uh, demand. Well, yeah, it is a dilemma because um, the fact is I don't believe in detachment. I believe in the ability to separate. So you have boundaries. So when you bond, you bond 100%, but then you have a time to separate. So that detachment or disconnection is all part of the bonding cycle. The thing that you need to do is be able to care about people you don't necessarily like, about an enemy. Or an adversary. Did I like Sam when I walked in? No. When he cut when he cut Sheila's throat, did I like him? No. Did I have a goal? Yes. And that was to get her out of the room and to get him out safely also. So the goal was the opportunity to create a bond with him. And actually, we created that bond very quickly over the common goal. Uh, and he ultimately thanked me for saying, helping me remember, helping him remember how much he loved his kids. You see, that's the mindset change. And that's what we have to be able to help people understand, playing to win as opposed to being defensive and playing not to lose. And I think the message that I'm getting is like, be self-aware, connect with people, bond with people, and establish trust. Because as long as you are engaging in a dialogue and if you're speaking the truth, you can definitely build that connection. And once you create that secure base in the minds of people, then you may be able to alter the behavior even if it is like one one person or like 100,000 uh, employees, it is still the same as long. Well. You all need to care and then you can effectively care. That's the message I'm getting. Is that a good summary, George? Bingo, that's right on. I would add one thing, VJ, and that is have a goal always. Always have a goal. Don't be caught without a goal. And when the goal is not working or you're not meeting it, 
take the feedback and adjust it in your execution. Don't ever be a hostage to anyone, anything, or even to yourself. Beautiful. And many thanks to you, George, again, for your time and for these rich insights. It's my pleasure.